keep joining we can involve as we go along so okay okay let's start. right right thank you sachin hello and warm welcome to everyone it's an uh, absolute pleasure to be here welcome to all of you in the room and also who is joining online and we all have a you know this really star panel here we are we have a uh, two sessions merged with the one one is education and outreach and one is policy so i will open the floor but before that i will introduce the sachin and then sachin will uh, take the floor and will start asking the question sachin holds a phd in green livelihood and is working as an associate professor in the geography in himachal pradesh an advocate for the community centric sustainable development paradigm he has published nearly 25 journal articles book chapters country reports on the issue of livelihood planning and career development so floor is yours sachin and thank you thank you anurag um i welcome everyone and uh, uh, as anurag has just pointed out uh, that we have uh, two sessions merged education and outreach along with policy issues and as you know that in uh, all we all know basically that in sustainability discourse uh, both these issues are of equal importance so let us start with the first theme that is education and outreach see in our uh, most of schools in himachal pradesh uh, these two lines are written generally in hindi but at times in english also it says shikshaarth aaiye sevarth jaiye come to learn and go to serve i guess these two uh, dimensions get merged in our first uh, discussion and without much ado i would uh, straight away i invite uh, jashri ji but jashri ravindran ji but before i ask her i'll just quickly introduce i mean i know her for many years but uh, many of our fellow participants may not be aware of her so she is a retired head mistress of uh, vidya dhiraj high school and junior college which is a small resource uh, school in nahar east who has worked in the field of environmental education for almost two decades as an administrator she has infused her students and the teachers to work locally think nationally and plan globally all the activities her achievements include the international school award the british council the school enterprise challenge uh, from the teacher man to fish uk the samaj shakti award community service through education the afs recognition for hosting international students and sending our school student to the us for a year on a cultural exchange program uh, so jashri ji basically um, what we intend to do here uh, is to look at what would be the core challenges what are core stakeholders what should be the, our key targets and what could be the strategies which we could use in order to link the entire sustainability debate uh with the um our education enterprise and uh, th there would be a common request uh, to all of the speakers that uh, given the limitation of the time that we have uh you have 3 to 5 minutes to uh, summarize your thoughts and of course if we get an opportunity we'll get back to you once again jay shri ji very warm afternoon to all it is my privilege to present before you how mainstream school system can also contribute in a very large way for environment education and to do that i have a presentation at the end of which maybe we can answer questions if there are so may i start the sure, presentation please. please please do i'm disabled may i be able to yeah um divya would you please do that uh to be able to screen share you might have to leave the room and uh, request rahul to make you a co-host okay sorry about this that's If, fine i may i request you to please leave the room and join again yes sure sure or else you can share uh, the presentation with me and i i have already I shared it. it i have already sent it by mail Okay, I'll uh, check it. Just give me a minute. Sorry about. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
So in the meanwhile, I would like to talk about the school. This is a 20 year old school. It started in 2000. Though I have been a teacher for the last 40 years, it's the last 20 years that I got associated with a school that was starting in my locality. And uh, the, the management of the school are absolutely passionate to the fact that we need to have a school that is different and that is child friendly and not parent friendly, not in any other way. So we, start, we started to develop our syllabus and our methodology of working in a different way. And we called ourselves the play school. So most of the schools have their play group in the smallest class nursery. We called ourselves as the play school. So children play from stand, play nursery onwards till the 10th standard. And in these 20 years, though the school is based in a slum and the students to the school come from that immediate background, we have nearly 600 children. They were not sent to our school because our school was doing something great, but they were sent because that was the closest available. And over a period of years, number of years, about five years now, uh, after that, Teach, the people started realizing that there is something that is different that is happening here. And the difference was that we paid more importance to the child and what the child required. So the child required to explore, the child required to paint, the child required to draw, the child required to speak his language, speak his peers, speak his achievements, and we were the listeners. So the teachers of our school were more like parents than real teachers. And that was one of the most important difference. And the fact that any child uh, with great difficulty sometimes comes late to school, we just welcome him into the school or he wants to go out of school, we allow him to go out of school. Or if there is a parent who wants to come, they, the school being in the slum region, it just happens that there are lots of visitors who come to their families and they want to come and see the Chotu who is in the first standard and the second standard. And we really welcome them because they are all a part of this child's growing up. So that's that's a summary of how the school has been. Amrita ji. Uh, yes, ma'am. I was I'm have your PPT with me. I'll share the screen for you. If you can just run the slideshow, yes. So this is the school. And that's a vision of the Swami Vidya Raja. It's as essential as food, knowledge. So we go out in all ways to gain access to this knowledge. You can go faster. The school is in a very, uh, just one, uh, uh, in a very important place ecologically. We are surrounded by the mangroves, the salt pans, the sewage treatment plant, the biodiversity center, the dumping ground, the Kanjur Metro Shed, Pawai Vihar, Tulsi Lakes, RA Colony, and the Yeur Forest. So we feel blessed to be surrounded by the cosmos. We have a lot of people who are uh, whom we are committed to. The management is extremely passionate. Teachers, students who are first generation learners, and parents who actually do not know much about what's happening in the school. And there are lots and lots and lots of resource people and donors and supporters. So this is an extremely um, important achievement for the school. Due to the work that is done by the school, we have a lot of CSR funding, people willing to come and uh, invest in our school. The solar project for the last two years has been giving electricity to the grid because there was no school at all. And these are the visitors who come to our school. Every year we have at least three to four visitors from abroad coming to ask us about how they can reach us, how they can work with us, and how, how we can go together 
to do more and more activities. Here are the visitors from Germany and Canada, and we have uh, different kinds of relations with them, sometimes environmentally. These are visitors from other schools who want to come and see how we are doing the work. What I have usually seen is that most of them come and they return saying that this is not possible in our school. It's possible in your school, but not our school. The big schools find it really difficult to mend their policies and uh, methodologies. So that's schools. Um, we have lots of officials from all strata, uh, environment, social, etc. And these are um, the mangrove officials who visit to tell us about the the daunting work that they are doing. And they ask our children whether they want to be the officers to police the mangroves. And usually children begin with by saying no, and then they get groomed into the talk and then they say, yes, we would like to help you. So that's Vanishakti, Mr. Stalin, who is our supporter. Rotary Club of Chembur West is an integral part of our school allowing us to do a lot of ecological activities and allowing our work to spread across to the international forums also. So uh, they have launched a plastic-based program where every month plastic is collected from all the entire area. Children come and collect from the buildings and send it to the school and the school gets revenue from this uh, plastic that is collected. So that's it. And uh, we go on cleaning projects. We are the cleaners of that entire area. Mangroves are cleaned by us. And here are some of our primary students who are uh, spending a whole day drawing art and craft competitions that are held across in the city. So they get also to visit the Rani Bag, um, uh, Baikala Zoo. And uh, they, they do wonderful. Amritaji, next. This is how the mangrove officials work with us and teach us about each species and what its use is in the entire ecosystem and how some of them are even used to make the paste as well as uh, some other uh, herbal medicines. We, we are... Uh, the voice of the place. So we take every opportunity to go and spread our message. And here are the children at the railway station, Nahur, which is close to us, going around and telling them about train travel, how to travel safe, because safety is integral to environment uh, also. And how uh, when the height of the train and the uh, platform was a little not properly aligned, people used to fall. So children were there to guide them and tell them to be careful. Then we have, uh, uh, we have a number of exchange programs. Children come and stay with us and our children also go abroad and they stay there for a year and they come back with their experiences. And we feel very proud at the end of the uh, entire exchange program to know that our children are contributing so much more than their compatriots abroad, in international schools abroad. So these are the management and the parents together. This is a Tuesday activity for our school where the students of standard 11 and 12 go to a place, a nursery place, and they make whatever that Haryali organization wants, maybe preparing saplings, maybe seed bombs, maybe uh, just segregating the seeds, uh, maybe just packaging them, but we do it all and children come back feeling physically exhausted and they come to know what it means to be a farmer. Uh, Jashri ji, uh, sorry to intervene, one more minute to go. Yes, uh, so uh, Amrita, you can go ahead plastic collection. This is the community cleaning project every year. We go to green building competitions to know what more we can do to make our school uh, green. And uh, the next one is a com community awareness 
a community awareness program by using uh, uh, drama and uh, speaking to the people, cleaning the school ourselves. Tata Energy does a lot by coming to our school and giving our children uh, documents to help our children go and understand what it means to conserve electricity. So children learn a lot about that. Yes, Amrita Ji. These are the competitions, street play competition. And uh, next one also. We, we uh, have grown nearly 300 plants uh, and sent it to various afforestation sites. So they remain with, uh, with us for about two years where we water them and it reaches a height of nearly about seven, six feet and so, and then we transport them and it goes to the afforestation. Poster competitions, clean array competitions, we clean the entire lake. And these are uh, children uh, testing the water just next to the school. Uh, for their NCSC project. A lot of the community workers come and help us when they see children doing the project. So when children start cleaning, immediately others from the community come. Here is a group of children who are preparing the land and prepare, digging out soil for afforestation. And the next one is, yes, Amrita. Even during the pandemic, we did not rest. Children collected plastic with masks and we, we collected nearly 45 kilos of plastic during this. The next one is all our students at the environment project for the state level where we did water testing. And we have uh, one, uh, now this is a mainstream school. So usually parents ask, when are you studying? What are you doing if you're doing all these things? We have won a lot of international awards. The International School Award twice, the School Enterprise Challenge for Entrepreneurship, the Global Teacher Award, and the AFS Award for hosting and sending students. We have 100% results every year and wonderful results. So that satisfies our parents and he is our student champion for the last two years. He shows us by his example as to how he recycles and green place begins with him. This is our work. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jashriji. Uh, and, uh, you know, kudos to you and your team for uh, doing this wonderful job. Uh, three uh, core messages which I could take out from your presentation. One was it's a perfect example of uh, uh, it's not just uh, education for environment. It's also education in an environment. You know? So that's very interesting experiential twist which you have given to entire educational discourse which is needed and your uh, what you said in the very beginning or what I said about you in the very beginning regarding you know connecting local with national with global uh, you are trying to put everything together in a nice way I had a couple of questions but uh, because of limitation of time I would straightway get on to the next uh, expert speaker Jashri Murali uh, welcome Jashri uh, Jashri comes from Mumbai. It's a large part of working life of three decades has been impacted by the development sector. She has been a member of the management team and academic committees in the NGO Vidya and contributed to language and life skills and nature education curricular areas. Some notable collaborations include literature as a peace building tool in cross-border friendships, addressing LGBT inclusion, eco-school project and setting teacher development programs. The story and the song and the poetry and the art are her friends as are the sparrows. So uh, truly a nature's person uh, in nature, enjoying nature and preserving and promoting nature. Uh, it's all yours, Jashree. Thank you, Sachinji, and thank you, Anurag. And thank you, Jashree, ma'am, for this, uh, uh, you know, for showing a slice of the world, of different parts of the world. Thank you so much. Uh, Sachin, I will begin with your poem. The, yesterday <laughs> evening, yesterday evening, I missed it, and I think poetry is one of my passion. And I, when I heard that, I asked myself, what was the color green to me? I think green only spoke of inclusion to me, mm -hmm. and that kind of, you know, that is what it is. I could, uh, you know, I think there was one line in your poem about in the brown there was the green, in the fallen leaf there was life, right? 
and in life there was death actually in, in life there was death and in death there is life the whole cycle indeed, of life indeed. was in that color green and thank you for uh, you know in that poem i think you summarized why we all were here and that kind of defined the purpose of this conference True. yeah yeah so when there's problem in life there's poetry when there is joy in life there is poetry so thank you sachin for being our gulzar ji thank you so very much okay i am passionate and i will begin i had not planned this as a part of my script i talk a little fast ask me to go slow if gargi is having a problem i shall go a little slow but that there it is i am to show you this book title my voice my verse uh this actually defined and redefined what in many ways what children would can do and i mean they're capable of much more my voice my verse is all it's a collection of 30 poems written by the children of vidya organically grown from the grassroots to commemorate 30 years of the ngo vidya which has defined and redefined my life i am now um, working not only i mean from vidya i have moved on to other uh, helping other low income schools as well as communities but that is where my experience of working in urban slums happen for the last 15 years what exactly were we doing in vidya very briefly about vidya uh, one can look at vidya's activities um, vidya india vidya-india.org 35 year old grassroots organization pan india so when i first met the founder very quickly she told me rashmi ji jashi what is the difference between your child and the child in the slum a child is a child where is the gap that's it she said just think simply what are the things that your child is getting and that child doesn't get bridge it in every way that you can and that summed up you know for a person who was coming new into the field i said okay so um my work was essentially in the in building and enriching supplemental learning programs and in around 2006 is when i first joined the ngo and i was there until 2019 Uh, the word first generation learner kept coming and kept coming and coming and coming in every proposal that one wrote and every report that one wrote and everything that you read today i would i'm so happy to tell you that there is a teacher from vidya who's gone to ukraine to study medicine a scholarship scheme has supported her she comes from a very conservative background there are children who play football in the slums of pavai all because of her collaboration there is a homeopathic doctor whose father is a painter there is a construction worker's child who has become an engineer and there is a filmmaker in the offering in the making in this lingwoods is it a miracle i think not all that it needed us for us to come together so what did the program look at a supplemental as a supplemental learning program we needed to bring enriched learning opportunities and what did this mean Uh, and coming from the low income schools and low income communities one i mean there is a saying in marathi i do not know how many of you understand vatsal tar vatsal the first vatsal is if you read and the second vatsal in the sentence is you will only then survive so literacy not only as a skill but literacy to empower you to be part of this democratic process where you can make an informed choice so the asa statistics will show us that children are not having foundational literacy i don't even need to go into the numbers so what could we do to make our libraries come alive so all our bastis all the programs wherever vidya runs there are there are libraries on the wall all that it takes is a rope and to string the books around and allow the child easy access affordability access and availability of books and children's literature is really ripe and rich today so the community reading programs are not only a skill building program but it's a program for a conversation with the story the art the poem the song and everything at the center and giving a child the voice very quickly i must talk to you about mahashweta devi's book the why why girl i think many of a qq ladki humne bahut sari logon ne padhi hogi isko um, many of us might have read I'm, this i'm sorry to interrupt you in between can you please slow down and ah, i knew i knew this i knew that when i'm passionate i'm fast so we're talking about mahashweta devi's book the why why girl there is a sentence in that book why can't we have rice twice a day and exactly one of the children put up the power of the book 
that is the power of the story that's the power of a library which is democratic giving everyone a chance to own that space and that's what the program was of course yes we brought children's literature to the slums everybody talked about going to kalaghoda we couldn't afford five children but we had 5000 or 1000 so the author said we would come this was people said we would come so okay so the slums became a point where people would come and interact all that we needed to do is to open our hearts and minds and say let's get together coming from reading an area which we found uh when as children we academically you know everyone was focused saying okay we have to you know clear the exams yes education is important if i don't clear my school i can't hope for the secondary education i can't hope for a tertiary education but what about life skills that was a big question mark and here we were and so and uh, the cbse definitely has a structured life skill curriculum but here it is very loose in maharashtra so we went about looking at who life skills and partnered with organizations and built in our own life skill programs and what was the life skill program what did it teach us it said yes how can we put empathy how can we put inclusion how can we put compassion how can we put the respect for the other and what does it take for me to not only become employable but also to become a socially responsible citizen and from this we derived we were a community based organization india is a land of festivals throw a stone and you will hit surely to hit something and a festival we said okay culture is important celebration is important but can we celebrate this more responsibly can we so our children would go to uh, ganesh ganpati bappa is our favorite go to you know go to person so i said okay they'd go with posters and put it up in the basti saying okay can you send your girl child to the vidya class can you get them to study so children would take such messages and teachers would take so these are the things that happened and most importantly one thing which we did mm. is we partnered with hamsafa trust because we found we were working with a lot of adolescents who were grappling with their identity with their gender sexuality and here was india a few years back i'm talking about a few years back when 377 was not read down we partnered with them and we began opening the minds of the management from a top to down we did sensitization we did sensitization programs and we included anti bullying modules and uh, lgbt inclusion as a part of our life skills to build in that sensitivity and awareness because very often the other is somebody whom i do not know how do i stop the othering how do i intersect with the other how do i hold hands and that is something which happened and this also happened when we had cross border friendships using literature as a tool i very quickly go on to the digital empower pro- empowerment program one of the their star programs which is offering employability skills to the adolescents youth as they migrate in their lives that is something really you know uh, really it's expanded the footprint and uh, are we equipping our children for failure failure is common place in low income schools may fail ho gaya that's it i don't want to study so our open school program is all about a second chance come back again it is all right it's only one year that you have lost we will hold hands and together let us see what you can do but all this do you think it could happen if there's no scholarship program we cannot just show a dream and leave it right so we said okay let's see whether we can work in that area and uh, this is where we went about doing things so uh, and were there challenges yes loads of it loads of it sometimes sustainability definitely was an issue in terms of resources one big thing i found was while we did child safety child protection we found that infrastructure for us you know to spend money to get a rented place in a community with a toilet inside the slum is very expensive and there would be a funding constraint under that budget head so we have teachers who are holding their bladder from morning to evening and not being able to go to the the toilet there and we're talking about a very big education which is holistic inclusive that used to really kind of break us it was something which was there no ventilation in the slums but still the spirit was high which i would think and of course to get the parents buy in when you want to when you want a girls football team you have to break mindsets yeah so i mean girls have to study they have to come for the evening classes 
you have to. So these were some of the challenges, but I'm sure uh, it is not insurmountable. Together, I think it's work in progress and will go on. So thank, thank you, you for this opportunity. <clears throat> thank I'm you. sorry, thank I, have you, been very, I have put the sign language interpreters to test by going <laughs> full throttle. Sorry. Yeah, thank I can you. understand. When you're Thank in you. the flow of your, uh, you know, yes. the things you're passionate about, yes. this typically happens. It's perfectly yes. fine. Uh -huh. There are quite a few lessons, but before I, um, I'm tempted to point out a couple of them. But again, that I've been, uh, uh, you know, getting uh, incessant uh, reminders that I should move to the next presenter, and uh, who is uh, uh, Smita Nair. I, I can see her. Smita, I guess you're around? Yes, I am here. Okay. Are you able to hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We can. Right. So Smita curates theme sessions, nature walks, museum walks, and other creative workshops for children and adults through her space, Marigold Creative, a child enrichment library and creative space. She has conducted workshops for school teachers. She is a volunteer for language development programs for government schools and under under the resourced learning spaces. She's a regular narrative for schools, lit fests, and book fairs in her current city, that is Kochi. Welcome, Smita. Uh, please try to limit your presentation between five to six sure. minutes. Sure. Thank you so much, uh, Sachin. So, hello, everyone. Uh, I am basically a trainer and uh, an independent educator, although I've had a long association with a formal school back in Bangalore. When I changed cities and I came to Kochi, I realized uh, something that my child was, uh, you know, was some places that my child couldn't visit. And that is how I set up the library. And when we set up the library, uh, and we had a lot of books from the Indian publishing houses. That's when we noticed that our children have no access, literally no access to children from our very own country, knowing about children from our very own country, be it from the Adivasi community or uh, children from another state altogether. Uh, you know, uh, so that's how the journey began. And uh, the whole thing uh, kind of grew organically in the sense that, you know, uh, the, uh, the nature thing was, uh, uh, you know, very, very, very close to my heart. And uh, uh, so the school system was not supporting anything to do with, you know, uh, the use of multiple intelligence in its uh, entirety. It was just gaining some textual knowledge, write them in the exam, and that's uh, that was done. And uh, what I uh, what I truly uh, do in our sessions or encourage children to explore is their multiple intelligence. And the most important intelligence I want them to hone uh, is the nature intelligence. Because stepping out, stepping out on the soil, treading on the soil softly, knowing what is beneath your feet, I think is the first realization for a child uh, to connect uh, itself with nature. So this has been my effort for the past several years, ever since I came to Cochin. And here are a few things that... Uh, we do apart from uh, you know so uh, the whole thing uh, is generated through a curriculum that has that has been developed through reading programs and storytelling sessions so uh, through these sessions we do nature walks uh, and nature walks just not in uh, parks public uh, parks but it's also uh, forests mini forests that the city has so i can boast of a few forests uh, you know, uh, city forest that we have here in Cochin and very few people know about it or have even taken uh, school children to go there and experience nature in its entirety. So uh, the moment we talked about city, I mean, uh, uh, nature walks and city forests, uh, everyone went, we have a city in the forest. Uh, we have the forest in the city. So it's because Kerala uh, has, uh, you know, developed so much now. We have very little green cover, even though when you look at a distance, it's all green. You know, we uh, our uh, green spaces are slowly, uh, uh, you know, becoming less. Yeah, one, just hold on, there's a, yes, 
Okay, so this uh, this uh, was a challenge because most uh, children who go, even in the government schools, they are all mainstream schools, and government schools do give them uh, government and government aided schools do give them a lot of exposure, but back home it is not so because their uh, you know spaces and the uh, the areas they come from may not be, uh, they may not be able to, uh, uh, you know, follow it. So what uh, what we had, uh, we we do is bring in experts or, you know, I take them on a walk. So a group of children, we come, uh, we go along, uh, we take a tread along the, uh, along the forest and we try and observe things around nature. What is it? Have we seen different color leaves? Uh, fallen down. So we pick them up. So we do a nature collage, leaf collage out of it. It is just there, not stick it on paper or anything. Just do a mandala. We collect the stones, different kinds of stones. We just leave it there and we just try and build our art. Smita, we are not able to hear you. You are on mute. Smita, you are on mute. Oh, okay, okay. I'm so sorry. I think something, something went. <laughs> okay. So these are uh, the experiences. So throughout the reading programs, what we have tried to do is creatively engage children with nature related activities uh, through leaf collages that I uh, just mentioned. So we collect everything that has fallen. When children are encouraged on a nature walk, we don't ask them to pluck things, uh, you know, pluck the leaves, pluck the flowers, uh, you know, make them, uh, uh, truly enjoy nature in its uh, uh, in, and enjoy its beauty the way it is, not you know plucking it and make uh, something out of it. Okay, so uh, yeah. so yes, I uh, know so Sangeeta has a very interesting question, but I'm yes. afraid uh, one minute yes. you uh, have. Uh, Okay, so then we've also initiated, uh, you know, uh, things like uh, growing microgreens, you know, grow food with your own hands. Yeah, uh, bring in seeds, look for seeds in your kitchen uh, and put it in a little bit of soil. It could be even a coconut shell. Put it, grow them and see the joy of harvesting them in a small span of time. So they know how the food comes to our plates. Then engaging with NGOs. So very interesting project I have engaged with uh, an NGO called Tree for Life is we are setting up butterfly gardens in the museum, in the city museum and in a school. So uh, since uh, so how did this all, all this began by my, uh, me setting up a butterfly garden in my own home and looking out for the kind of butterflies that visit our garden, uh, you know, documenting them, the host plants that we need, uh, and the plants that can provide nectars to these butterflies or any other insects. It's just not butterflies, there are damselflies, dragonflies, the bees and everything. So these are small projects, micro projects that can be done in our homes and extended it to the community, be it in school or be it in the museum. So the museum thing was very interesting because there is a lot of academic, uh, you know, uh, uh, stuff that goes on in the museum children walk into the museum and there's a huge sprawling uh, you know uh, open space with trees but children lack something like you know an engagement with the outside space also in the museum because most of the workshops happen and then you know the, uh, the museum also wanted some connection to the trees the t uh, the children going around touching the trees uh, you know hugging them so we tried and did the tree hugs and uh, you know they want and more of a uh, more of a uh, what do i say uh, an immersive learning not uh, not just the museum artifacts inside but also what is around the museum and this was uh, the museum education was uh, the museum education uh, group believes that it's just not what they see inside the museum. It should also be what there is outside the museum. That is the trees, the grass, and the flowers, and the insects, and the many, many minute uh, living beings that are around, and how we can be mindful about the whole thing. And 
and all these are done through stories we sit under the tree we narrate our stories we encourage children to tell stories around trees about little uh, you know uh, little things and all that so this is how it is uh, done uh, thank you smita uh, thank you very much yeah. for your very interesting passionate and very work very far reaching consequences with this come to the first end of the first part that is education outreach related stuff and i am being reminded that the session would glow clo get closed uh, in 15 minutes and we have one uh, bunch of speakers sachin waiting. i had uh, sachin i had requested uh, anand to sure. the 10 minutes at least for us okay great yeah. so uh, without much ado i would uh, uh, ask you to join us for the second part that is on policy issues and Uh, to discuss policies around sustainability in women education youth and a very policy that affects our discourse first of all i would invite divesh sharma uh, who is presently director at cats international where he heads the cats cats center for competition investment and economic regulations and spearheads a wide range of projects on energy competition data and technology and economy and labor he has 16 plus years of experience in advising government psus bu heads CXO market intelligence data banks garnering commercial acumen developing strategic decision making models and regulatory where with all in policy advocacy within key sectors such as power renewables environmentally governance it infra smart cities and smart buildings and green and sustainable uh, <laughs> technologies yeah so uh, yeah i made got your point a lot of that Sorry. yeah so uh, yeah yeah sort of why i could i, I really so, i mean because of perhaps uh, the limitation of time that we have so divesh has very wide range of experiences across sectors so divesh it's your time 3 to 5 minutes please absolutely uh, thank you so much sachin uh, this was uh, i'm sorry for an exhaustive introduction but i still try to keep it crisp uh, let me start uh, with a thank you note to you and the uh, extended organization for setting this up it was very uh, a passionate delivery of uh, everyone's uh, uh, passion let's say that ways uh, okay let's come coming back to me uh, don't worry i'll be absolutely uh, peaceful and slow as i go ahead in this uh, let me start with a broad introduction of uh, the outfit we are in as of now so which is called cats international uh, elaboratively consumer unity trust society uh this was established uh, way back in 1983 where we've been working for welfare of consumers passionately right from the grassroots to the international level so the story uh, around uh, starts around 1983 and then uh, we peaked uh, in our position in 1990s where we were uh, part of the uruguay round discussions and uh, we were at the helm of uh, you know the consumer engagement programs and uh, amplifying the voice of the consumer in different across all uh, key sectors uh, at the international or world forums uh cats mission is uh, largely around consumer sovereignty in the framework of social justice economic equality and environmental balance within and across within and across borders so as i say within and across borders we have uh, uh, presently three offices in the country Uh, which is based out in jaipur uh, headquartered in jaipur and we have an office a uh, resource center in delhi as well as in kolkata uh, we are also spread out in three uh, uh, large continents which is uh, of course asia africa uh, us and we have a office in geneva also and it's not uh, about having an office or a branch uh, you know consulting space but it is more about speaking uh, of the locals over there speaking about the people over there these offices were not set up as an investment initiative but largely where the government invited us that in you know in terms of safeguarding consumer interest cats uh, should have uh, an extended arm in these countries not only uh, uh, safeguarding consumer interest but also about uh, enhancing the position of competition uh the start the the beginning of cuts essentially started from a very small initiative uh, sachin and that was gram gadar and gram gadar uh, runs around rajasthan in every nook and corner 
of Rajasthan. Every uh, villager knows about it, which, where it speaks into the local language and it engages consumer right, uh, uh, you know, from the grassroots. And then uh, it connects at different tiers. Three questions, such as I take this conversation on a second gear, uh, just and as an introspection as we speaking about environment and policies. Could we just know, this is a question which runs in every, in every platform. When was this, you know, where the air quality index was almost at 999 in Delhi and CR? I'm sure very many of us have the answer. It was in 2016, it was in 2017, 18, 19. But the beauty is why it was 999? Because the meter had only three digit calculator. It could only count till hundreds. If we had 1000, or 10,000, it would have been somewhere around 1,500 or 2,000. Second question is, you know, when was it probably a river was called out as most polluted and you cannot draw water for drinking or water was not permissible for drinking? It was again, in you know, multiple amount of years, but the surprising element was these rivers were Ganga, the most sacred river of ours, Yamuna, Miti. So as I speak to you about policies, we catch just giving you a glimpse because you know there are various sectors we work in. We work in e-governance, we go work in energy, we work in competition, we work, work in uh, economic regulations. We are also representing a different area. We have uh, a, a specific arm of consumer uh, action. We have a separate arm in uh, trade and economic policies. So not giving a very extended arm, and I don't want to... Uh, you know, uh, spread out the discussion in the discourse. I just want to keep it very, very precise and crisp that these are areas where, you know, which catches cuts eyes. And our General Secretary, Sri uh, Pradeep Singh Mehta, who happens to be at the helm of, uh, you know, at larger initiatives. Uh, he's been part of the joint parliamentary meetings also. He's been part of the UNCTAD events. And he takes these issues with very fine uh, lenses and amplifies them to the right address. So as I speak about you, about, as I just spoke about the air quality index, I spoke about the river. These are all about environmental impact you know, concerns, which I want to touch upon during this meeting. I just want to address this issue that apart from ensuring that there is an ROI to every project, we must also mention, you know, we must also make sure. Sorry, Fred, could you uh, expand on that acronym? Well, thank you so much, uh, Saurav. Uh, as part of assessing that there's a return on investment, return on investment on every project, there must be also a, a public rate of return on every project which government invests on. Where, across it is not small, medium, large, or it could be even strategic for that sense. And in that initiative, the government would also, you know, we make sure that the government also ensures that livelihoods, right of ways, and people security is not harmed and damaged. This is the hammering point I want to mention over here. The EIA, which is called Environment Impact Assessment, which uh, spun off in 1970 with US initiative uh, of uh, National Environment Policy Act, you know, had different facade, uh, facades in different countries. And in India, it took shape uh, in al almost 1986, and then going forward with different uh, uh, element of policies like water protection, uh, 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 like uh, you had the Biological Diversity Act, the Public Liability Insurance Act, National Green Tribunal Act, so on and so forth. But somehow that insurance, that assurance, let's say, of uh, safety of water, safety of food quality to general people, the safety of air, quality of air, ensuring good quality of air, and then making sure that the locals are, you know, not harmed with any project is a major, uh, you know, element of concern. And that is where we work around. Uh, I will just wrap up my uh, introduction by just giving you a sight on few, you know, recent projects we have done, wherein uh, we don't, uh, we have taken uh, away. We have, uh, sorry, uh, uh, we have 30 seconds for you. Okay, thank you so much. Well, I'll just give you a quick uh, hammering point on this and I, I would conclude my uh, position 
by saying that uh, we have been doing this work in terms of not juxtaposing the international ideas to uh, the ground or uh, to villages, but rather than doing a seed community kind of initiative, wherein we bring the locals and the community leaders to government officials and make them uh, make their uh, concerns respected at forums, and then make sure that the policies are aligned to low, uh, to ground uh, assessment. Thank you so much, Sachin. This was great. Thank you, thank you, Dibesh. Thank you. Uh, I'm getting. Uh messages from the admin that the session will get automatically closed by 3.15. So we have two more speakers, Hemant and uh, Advocate Lara Jasani. Hemant is a public policy researcher at the Bharti Institute of Public Policy at the Indian School of Business. His research is on complex systems focusing on sustainability evidence-based policy and political action. He has also worked with multiple state governments on analyzing and framing policies on industrial development and data governance. Hemant, three to four minutes, please. We have Hemant here. I uh, do not see him in the group chat. Uh, no, no, I right. can't see him. Okay. So, we should so shall, go I, to shall, I, shall I go to the next? Uh, yeah, please. Speaker? Yeah, please. Yeah, yeah, Advocate Lara Jasani has been practicing a law in Indian courts for over a decade and is currently an independent litigator with her primary practice based out of Bombay High Court and National Green Tribunal. She takes up cases of human rights violation, in particular constitutional, environmental development and anti-corruption matters and in defense of human rights defenders. In particular, she represents project affected communities and CSOs in matters pertaining to environmental concerns and violations. She is also engaged in public policy and advocacy work on democratic rights and civil liberties issues and in human rights and legal education. She is a part of PUCL, People's Union for Civil Liberties. She works with several community-based organizations and collectives and collaborates with uh, civil society organizations, businesses and human rights initiatives and intersectional feminist groups on issue basis. Lara? Thank you so much, uh, Sachin. And um, I would also like to echo uh, what the earlier speakers have said that, uh, you know, to appreciate the efforts taken to organize a very important conference. And I think it's also very timely. We are at a time when, you know, COP26 uh, has been going on. There have been concerns which have been expressed by the you know, United Nations and their chiefs on the deteriorating condition of the environment. And much of it is linked to what we're going to talk about uh, in terms of the environmental policy. And uh, we always look at it, and like you also mentioned, that you know, as uh, we're talking very superficially at a global level, without uh, you know, understanding uh, the local and regional perspective. And I think that's one of the flaws that has also uh, been there in our uh, policy, as well as policy advocacy. And um, uh, I, I'd also like to mention another very important thing, and it's not an accident that um, the uh, you know uh, education and policy um, uh, session were uh, linked together. Clearly, uh, you know one of the first uh, from one of the first steps towards uh, remedying or you know towards uh, protecting the environment is uh, uh, actually uh, actually comes from legal education and awareness and environmental education and awareness and uh, uh, it's 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 the educators play an extremely important role in developing that sensibility and uh, to also uh, you know uh, uh, to, to also provide uh, uh, that perspective to people to understand what their rights are and what the rights based approach to environment is and where i work uh, as a lawyer is in that in, in that actual crux of the rights based approach to the environment not looking at uh, you know environment as just nature but uh, looking at it as our relationship with you know nature and and, and uh, that also brings with it several duties and that brings with it you know obligations of the state to protect the environment in in uh, if we look at you know the indian jurisprudence uh, the right to uh, a healthy environment is not really a fundamental right it is not carved out as a separate fundamental right. It has been interpreted over time by courts as to be part of Article 21, which is our right to life, because we cannot live a, right, a life of dignity without uh, you know, having a healthy environment. We cannot get, a lot of other rights are linked with the right to environment. 
for instance, our you know right to health is very closely linked to environment. Uh, uh, the earlier speakers spoke about you know how uh, the air pollution has hit the roof, and we're not even really quantifying the amount of damage that has been done uh, because we don't have the tools to do it. But uh, 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 or, or even the intention or the will to do it because it's going to be far far alarming. It's not, you know, we are we are 179th out of 180 countries uh, as far as our air quality is concerned, as per the Environment Performance Index. And uh, we all are breathing this air. 12.5% deaths, as per the Lancet report, have been because of environmental pollution. So we are talking about a very stark situation as far as our environmental concerns are, are, are there. Now, a very important thing when we look at environmental policy is how does it address these concerns and what is the approach to this policy? A rights-based approach to, you know, environmental rights, you know, has some very important elements. First and foremost, to be able to access our environmental right, we need information. So access to information is an extremely important part of it. And we have to look at, do we have the policies which provide us the information to access our rights? Second and very crucial aspect of you know, environmental policy when it comes to environmental rights is public participation and prior notice as far as our policies are concerned, a prior notification. So once we have the information, what do we do with that information? We, unless if we don't have the right to have a say in the environmental policies that are being formulated. So with this, you know, we, we come to a very important aspect. We have uh, been in discussion is the draft environment impact notification of 2020, which is in the offing, the last date now to submit comments to it after the translations of that policy have been released in 2020. Uh, Lara, you need to conclude. It will automatically get disconnected. Oh. So another couple of seconds, maybe. Oh, my I'm God. I'm so okay. sorry. I'm so sorry. Yeah, yeah. That. No, I understand uh, the time <laughs> crunch. But uh, I, I just, I, 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 I don't know what I can conclude in seconds. But yeah, I, I know. it's very important for us to look at, you know, policy also in terms of sure. our values and to look at, you know, uh, whether we have uh, enough to, you know, remedy, protect and, you know, basically uh, engage with, you know, uh, the environment as friends of the environment. And that there, that's where we have to be very aware citizens. We need to monitor. We need to, you know, monitor not just the policy, but what is happening around our immediate environment. I think as litigators, that is what we expect from, you know, the citizens. So... <laughs> <laughs> so asked, sorry. Uh, the breakout room in like uh, fifty seconds. So yeah. Um, so we uh, have yeah one minute. Yeah, and roughly, one yeah. and one final thing sure. that I would like to say is that uh, we have to hold our institutions accountable, whether they are the courts, whether they are the environmental bodies, whether you know uh, uh, whether it is uh, all of the other democratic processes that are, that were put in place because they are slowly eroding. We're seeing a you know systematic dilution of policy. So we have to make sure that we hold them accountable and that we also protect environmental activists who I feel are most in danger right now. So uh, I, I'll just end with that. And thank you very much for having me here <laughs> for whatever limited time. Hopefully I, really thank, I really thank all the speakers, especially Lara for you know, bearing with our dictatorial <laughs> timekeeping <laughs> regime. Uh, back to all the participants from the breakout group. Yes. I, I hope you all had a very, very yeah. good Sorry. Yeah, no, I'm just checking if Sachin is still here because we...